This Advent season, as we light the candle of hope, we read to you a message from the prophet Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Good day, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to another Mandawe Gospel Church virtual ceremony. It is with a joyous heart that I greet all of you a happy Thanksgiving. I also want to extend my gratitude to, towards all of you, uh, MGC, and most especially Erica for sending a wonderful special presentation that you can all see in our church's Thanksgiving program in YouTube. However, Going back to our study today on the book of Deuteronomy, let us open our Bibles to Deuteronomy 12, verses 1 to 5. Deuteronomy 12, 1 to 5, where we find what seems to be a new command being given to Israel, a command that is only applicable when they have entered and conquered the promised land. So it's a very exciting thing for them to hear this command because it is assured that they are going to be victorious. So it's something for them to look forward to. Now, these new commands that Moses was giving them, it's not really new. In fact, they've been told numerous times. However, in this particular instance, they are a little bit more specific than usual. Okay? And one of our youth would often say that when God gives specific commands, it usually means that it's either going to be broken or the people have already broken it. But joking aside, let us read verse 1. Deuteronomy 12, 1 says, These are the decrees and regulation you must, uh, you must be careful to obey when you live in the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must obey them as long as you live. Let's stop there for a while. As long as you live. Why? Why should they? They're out of the hot desert. There is food aplenty. And they, are, they have finally arrived at the destination that they had, so, uh, they had longed for so many years. So why should they follow? Verse 1 is very clear. Because God gave it to them. God is giving it to them. When you have achieved everything, when peace comes, plenty comes, and prosperity everywhere you look, it is so easy for us to say, hmm, we did all this. We deserve this. No. No, you have to stop there. Remember, this land that they are occupying, 
It was not earned. It was given. This was not through their hard work. This was not through strength. This was not through their might. But this is a gift that God wanted to give them. So they should or they should want to follow everything that God wants them to do. Because just as quickly as God gave it to them, it can be quickly taken and ruined by their own pride. The moment they stop following, the moment they stop listening to God, is the moment everything goes downhill. Not because God's going to take it, but because of their own pride and hubris. So be very careful, and this applies to all of us. So be very careful that here on out, every day, now that you see all the prosperity, the peace, the plenty, we must be even more careful. We must be very careful not to forget that all of that is a gift from God. So guard your heart because now more than ever, pride is waiting for us. And as Proverbs always says, pride comes before the fall. So let's continue. Verse 2 and verse 3. Verse 2 says, When you drive out the nations that live there, you must destroy all the places where they worship their gods. High on the mountains, up on the hills, under every green tree. Break down, break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars. Burn their Asherah poles and cut down their carved idols. Completely erase the names of their god. Now, when they drive out uh, the people and occupy the promised land, they are to destroy all semblance of pagan worship. They were not left on their own without any further work. God says, when you have conquered, when you have done all this, here is very strict commands. And the reason why I say strict commands is because of how it is given. You see, the words he uses, he says, every place you go, up on the, up on the mountains, on the hills, every green tree, every place that was used for worship, okay, that was used for worship of other gods, you must destroy them. And the words here are break them, smash them, burn them, cut them, completely erase them, wipe it out of existence. These are very strong words, very, very mean, right? very mean. Why would God tell us to destroy and burn and smash and cut, to erase them from all existence? What a waste. What a waste. Why couldn't we just repurpose it, God? Why couldn't we just use some of the materials, smelt it down, use it for our own? These words, uh, they seem so, they seem like such a, an errand to do. Whoa, this is too much, God. Why did Israel have to go through so much to go through such lengths? Why couldn't they just coexist? This is our generation now. Why can't we just coexist with sin? Why can't we just mind, why don't you just mind your own business? Why can't we just coexist? Because here's the thing. Our God is different. God is different. In many worldviews where gods share worship with each other, where many other gods just mix and mix and mix and just worship whichever you want, Yahweh is not that kind of God. The first commandment is first for a very good reason. Everything else is creation and not the creator. There is a particular narrative in 1 Samuel 5 where the sons of Eli had brought the Ark of Covenant uh, in battle because they were losing. They thought if we brought the Ark of the Covenant, God uh, would be forced to help us. God would be swayed to give us victory in battle. But God was not with them and they lost. And the ark was taken by the enemies and brought into, their, uh, into, their, uh, into the temple of their gods. And this is in verse 2. So 1 Samuel 5, verse 2. They carried the ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon, put him in his place again. Okay, so they propped him up. Uh, verse 4, But the next morning, the same thing happened again. Dagon had fallen face down before the ark of the Lord. This time, his head and hands had broken off and were lying in the doorway. Only the trunk of his body was left intact. This is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor anyone who enters the temple of Dagon in Ashdod 
will step on its threshold. Then the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashdod and the nearby villages with a plague of tumors. When the people realized what was happening, they cried out, We cannot keep the ark of the God of Israel here any longer. He is against us. He will, uh, we will all be destroyed along with Dagon, our God. Our God is different. Our God is alive. There is no one, there is nothing like our God. What Israel was doing in destroying all the poles, all the statues, all the pillars was a sign of defiance towards the many gods of the land of Canaan. It was to show that their gods could not defend themselves. Their gods were powerless. They could not harm or curse the people of Israel. These carved images neither had the power to stop Israel nor enact vengeance for what they were doing. But our God is able. Our God does not need us to defend Him. Do you think our God needs our help? Of course not. Our God is different. Verse 4 and verse 5. Let's continue. Verse 4 and verse 5. Do not worship the Lord your God in the way these pagan people worship their gods. Rather, you must seek the Lord your God at the place of worship he himself will choose from among all the tribes, the place where his name will be honored. The worship of God should be different. It is often shown that the detestable practices of the pagans in Canaan directly influence the laws that God had given the people. Laws such as uh, all life should be viewed as sacred. They should not cut themselves. They should not consume blood. They should not consume certain animals. They could not sacrifice their children or pigs, could not put markings on their bodies. They should strive for purity. They, they were to be kind. They should not steal or kill whenever they feel like it. Their basic urges were controlled by the commands of God. God made sure that Israel was a community that everyone could live in safety and in peace. The laws were not only practical or logical, but it was in direct contrast to many of the practices during that time. If they were to live different lives, how much more, how much more was their worship to God be different as well? They should not worship God in just anywhere or any way they like. Unlike the pagans who would walk around, find an object that seemed unique, and they were like, oh, look at that tree. Let's put our image there and worship that. Oh, look at that cow. It has weird-looking eyes. Let's worship that. Oh, my harvest is not bearing crops. I guess it's time to kill my child. Absolutely not. Israel is to be made aware that there is only one God. This God cares for them cares for how they do things. God was not like, Sige, bahala, ramo, din kay kilo. No, God was like, you have to do it this way. You have to do it my way. It will help each and every one of you live in peace and in love with each other. I get, I get why now it would be a little weird, diba? because we're not bound to a single place anymore. God is not telling us to worship in a uh, in just one place. The creation of churches and our understanding of churches and what churches are, uh, it makes us realize by that we can worship God wherever and uh, whenever. Yet, during Israel's time, with the concept of a single God was so foreign to the majority, to have a place, to have a place where you could say, our God dwells there. He is present there. He hears us when we worship. That is something no other nation could boast about. Our God is alive there. He hears us. He sees us. He knows what we are doing. Many do not seem to realize that when God centralized worship, when God centralized all worship to a single area, it meant that the chance, okay, it meant that the chances of coming up with wrong practices was diminished. Verse 6 tells us, Deuteronomy 12, 6 tells us that only at that specific place could they offer sacrifices, tithes, and worship. When they got to that place, they would also be met by people who knew what to do, who are assigned to do it, and does it well and teaches them how to do it. 
Having a designated place of worship is formative in our orthodoxy and orthopraxy of worshiping God. So the next time you ask, why do we have to go to church? Ma, pa, why do we always have to wake up so early and go to church? It's too early. Because it's formative. It teaches us what God wants from us, what God needs from us, how to do it, and, and what not to do. So it's a very important thing that we worship together. Very recently, me and my father uh, were watching a movie called The Devil All the Time. Okay? So I know it sounds very contrast <laughs> because of my profession, but in one scene where the wife of the protagonist was sick, okay, was about to die from illness, the protagonist, the character, started to pray. And he asked his son to pray with him fervently because the doctors could not do anything else. They had hoped that God would answer them. But God was silent to their plea. God uh, was not healing his wife. So in the mind of the character, he thought, you know what? God needs a life for a life. If for, uh, in order for my wife to be healed, something had to die and take her place. So do you know what he did? He took the family dog and crucified that dog because he thought that was what God wanted. This was just a movie. But do you understand what man is capable of on the pretense that this is something God wants or this is something that can force God's hand? Deuteronomy 12 does seem old, but it's not. It's a little bit weird. But it's very much relevant today. It serves to showcase that there is an innate desire of, for people to worship God. Our God does not dismiss our worship to Him. And He also gives us the proper way at which we ought to express that worship. So, uh, in closing, uh, this, is, this was really weird because when I was making this sermon, I was really stuck. I, I really didn't know what lesson or what particular lesson. I'm sure some of you already got the lesson from reading or from listening to the points that I gave. But I was really stuck. I was like, what does God want me to say, Manjud, in closing? So uh, I was wondering, and then suddenly, Joy chatted me. And it was, I think it was like three days or uh, it was it's very recent. And he says, uh, Pastor, you need to uh, speak about hope. Okay, you need to speak about hope for our four-season Advent series. And in my mind, I was like, Joey, come on, you have to text me maybe two weeks or three weeks so I can prepare ahead of time. And so I was thinking, should I change my sermon? Should I just scrap all of this? Because clearly, this does not talk about hope. I don't want to force the issue. So the more I thought about it, the more I kept panicking, like, what am I going to do? I have to talk about hope. This isn't about hope. Ah, and I was thinking, this is Joy's fault. All of this is Joy's fault. So the more I thought about it, and then the more I read it, I realized that Deuteronomy 12 does talk about hope. It's such a unique thing because the Lord had used joy <laughs> to tell me of the lesson that He wants to impart. In our world, where new religion pops up every day, where new idols are being erected and worshipped by all kinds of people, we find hope that our God is the one true God. He is alive. He is mighty. He is not a created thing. He does not need anything from us. So He cannot be forced or swayed to do what, to do what we think is right. He is not forced or swayed to hurt other people. Our God is different. He is powerful. He is the Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, our great provider, our eternal hope and joy forever. Our God, is not, uh, our God is not only true, but He is the only God that listens and accepts our worship. These idols that man have created, they do not care for them. They do not listen to them. They cannot talk to them. They do not hear what they have to say. They will never answer. But God, our God, is always present. He hears our plight. He hears our thanksgiving. He accepts our worship and loves those that offer it. We are His children whom He loves and had given His Son to save. That is our hope. What an amazing hope that we have. There is no one like our God. 
and our hope in Him, His Word, and in His promises, God will never disappoint and He will never be lacking. Shall we pray? Dear Father, we are so thankful for Your Word. We are shown a picture of Your strength that in this world where so many new idols, where so many new gods and so many people uh, forcing uh, their views on us, we can rest assured in that You are the true God. What You want us to do, what You need us to do is in Your Word. We, cannot, we don't have to guess we don't have to wonder or ponder. All of it is in your word. And we are, placed, uh, we are given such confidence because we know that your word is good. Your word is true. Your word is powerful. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you that when we pray, that when we worship, that when we come to before you, you hear us. You, you love it, dear Father. You love when your children come before you. So, Lord, Help us to worship you in earnest, to pray in earnest, to show our love in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you everyone and have a wonderful day. Free.